So our next talk is gonna be security requirements engineering by Chris Alberts. And Chris Alberts is a principal engineer in the CERT division at SEI, where he leads applied research projects in software assurance and cybersecurity. His research in, uh, interests include risk analysis, security requirements engineering, measurement analysis, modeling and simulation, and assessment. And he has published two books and over 40 technical reports and articles. So Chris is queued up. Again, Mark is going to stay on stage with us as a, a facil facilitator to, to continue the conversation. But Chris, welcome. All yours. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to talk uh, to three uh, topics today. Uh, I'll give some background information, talking about some of the basic concepts be behind uh, security requirements engineering. Then I'll look at the security engineering risk analysis method, or CIRA. That's going to be the focus of the talk. I'm going to talk uh, basically showing how we can integrate, better integrate uh, risk analysis into the requirements process. And then I'll summarize with a few key points. So let's go start with the background. Starting with software assurance and the definition and kind of what we think about when we, uh, when we talk about software assurance. Uh, two key aspects, uh, predictable execution, and, that, and there we're lo really looking at, does the software function as intended, and then trustworthiness. Uh, are there any exploitable weaknesses in the uh, software? And what we're trying to do is establish a level of confidence in those two key aspects. And requirements is, is, a key as, is a key piece of that. And so we're looking at, this is the life cycle model that Mark showed just a few minutes ago, and we're looking at the, at the very early part of the life cycle at defining the requirements and um, focusing on the early uh, acquisition, acquisition aspects of software. So let's talk about what software security requirements are. Uh, I define these as features such as controls or constraints that specify, specify how to preserve the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of critical data in the system. And so you'll hear me reference CIA, uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, multiple times throughout this talk. And because that that's kind of forms the goals of what we're trying to do with software security requirements. Okay, a polling question again. Like I said, we're going to ask multiple of these throughout the day to get an idea of who's with us in the audience, and that's going to help Chris Taylor, some of his speaking points, but the question that's going to pop up now is, are you experienced in developing security requirements? And that is a simple yes or no question, and you will have that on your screen now. And we're going to go back to Chris. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. Um, so I just uh, head to the next slide? Yeah, go ahead to the next slide, and we'll give them about 15 or 20 seconds of vote, and I'll give you results. Okay, with software security requirements, um, here's some of the key activities. I'll kind of use these as kind of the anchor for the talk, and then I'll show you next uh, where we're going to focus. Start by agreeing on definitions. You want to make sure that everyone's talking the same language. Um, a lot of problems uh, come about with respect to security because people often have different views of, of what terms mean, and often there are different variations on terminology. So when people come into a requirement situation, they may have different ideas about what things mean. You want to get everyone on the same page. Second key activity is to identify system assets and security goals. So this is starts out by looking at what are the, what's the critical data that the system stores, processes, and transmits. And once you understand that, then you want to know what's important about it from a confidentiality, integrity, and availability perspective. And now you have the, uh, the critical data and the um, security goals. The third step then is to look at the risks. And, and much like uh, Chris's previous presentation, kind of what they were doing when you think about it, is they were looking at what they knew about the system and they were starting to think about how can we attack it? Well, that's what you're doing in step three here. It's, you're trying to think of how can we, um, uh, based on what we know currently, remember we're early in the life cycle so we don't have a, 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 a full picture, but we have some logical diagrams that we can look at how things are interconnected. So we can make some plausible guesses. And so you do the, the risk analysis, and then based on that, you decide, you decide, are there design weaknesses? And for those design weaknesses, that feeds into step four, your illicit uh, security requirements. You build requirements for those weaknesses, and then categorize the requirements, which essentially means you map them back to the uh, security goals that you defined. Then develop priorities, which ones are most important, which ones are least important, because uh, there's always trade-offs, and you have to make sure that you um, focus on what's important uh, to address. 
And then the last step is to inspect the security requirements. Here, what you want to do is to um, look for um, weaknesses or, or, or problems with the requirements and, and get in and uh, correct those flaws as early as possible. So, Chris, to wrap up our polling question real quick, we had 57% with no. They are not experienced in developing security requirements and 43% yes. Okay. So hopefully I can tell your, tailor your talk a little. Okay. And so here's where we're going to focus in this module. And we're going to look mm -hmm. at uh, primarily at steps two, two and three, looking at the uh, identifying the assets and the goals and then performing the risk analysis. But I'll show you later on how, how what we do in these steps actually um, looks at some of the subsequent steps as well. Uh, Chris, could you explain a little bit about where these steps came from? Sure. Um, well, these are there are a lot of different um, uh, methods out there. Um, I took these and, and derived them from uh, a, a method that we developed here at the SEI called Square Security Quality Requirements Engineering, and um, that has a, a defines a, a set of steps. And um, uh, I kind of took out the key steps uh, that uh, really uh, focused on some some of the um, I, I think the, the the key high points that you need to, to look at in security requirements mm -hmm. engineering. Anything you want to add on Square? Because um, I know you know a lot about that too. <laughs> well, that's why I was going to ask you uh, sort of the, some of the, the method and the history behind Square and how well it's been used in practice. Well, Square is actually a, yeah. a fairly um, um, mature product. Uh, it's been around for more than a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's been um, developed. Uh, Nancy Mead was the lead developer at the SEI. She'd worked with um, a number of students in the um, Master of uh, Software Engineering program at, at the SEI to develop uh, the technique, and they uh, applied it with a, a variety of different um, uh, industry organizations. And um, they, they built uh, several variations on it for acquisition and other aspects of uh, specific aspects of, of, of the engineering process. And they've created uh, some tools to support it. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot in place uh, for, for that. And it walks you through these steps um, uh, and, and really helps guide you uh, into applying uh, the, the method. So this is another example of things that we already know how to do well. It's merely taking the discipline to apply them. Right, and getting people to adopt yeah. them and mm -hmm. use them. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look at the risk aspects of uh, security requirements engineering with the CIRA method. And that leads us to another polling question to help Chris tailor his talk. And that we'd like to know, are you experienced in assessing security risk? Simple yes, no. And uh, we can turn it back to you, Chris, and I'll chime back in with the results in about a couple seconds. Great. Thanks, Shane. So this... Um, method that we developed is uh, a systematic approach for analyzing security risk across the life cycle. And we're, we're looking at trying to get at some of the complexities of, of risk. And I'll kind of talk to that in some sub subsequent slides. Um, what we're looking is to um, build software, uh, build security into systems. So starting early in the life cycle. And we, you can actually recursively apply this at different points in the life cycle. And so we want to address the design weaknesses as early as possible address, uh, creates requirements for them so we can start to mitigate them and then ultimately deploy systems with a reduced uh, residual cybersecurity risk. And to close out our polling real quick, yeah. we were at 55% no, not experienced in assessing okay. security risk and 45% yes. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of the basics of, of, of what we do in, uh, in the CIRA method. Um, I'm going to start with something that's kind of different that, 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 uh, that we're trying to incorporate into our risk analysis methods than some of, some of, of the techniques that we worked on uh, 10 years or so ago. And that's a, a scenario-based approach. So this picture, I think, kind of um, gets to that idea. You start with a threat actor. Uh, and, and in fact, we can accommodate snares with multiple threat actors. Uh, accessing the infrastructure, exploiting weaknesses to target mission data. And you want to do, and the threat actor is, is trying to achieve some kind of a goal. That's to um, uh, some adverse outcome related to the data, disclosure of data, modification of data, uh, affecting the availability of data. And so what we're seeing here is that those map to confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Once you do that, the question is, well, what happens then? Well, then we look at how does that affect the mission? So in, in CIRA, our focus is on mission impact. So we look at workflows, or which are uh, the other um, a synonym for that is mission thread or business process. We map those out, look at 
where the data affects the business process and just see what might happen. And we use that to help us project the consequences uh, when we're doing the risk analysis. And then um, those adverse consequences to the outcome can lead to mission degradation or mission failure. And so one of the key aspects in doing these scenarios is to first start out by understanding how the, 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 um, the system performs under normal circumstances, identifying what we call the baseline of operational performance. And so that's the first task in uh, the four tasks that we've defined in the CIRA method. First, we understand the operational context. And I'll talk to each of these uh, specifically as we mm -hmm. move through, through the talk. Then we uh, look at identifying the risk scenarios, analyzing them, and then developing control plans. So the other thing I want to point out is uh, all the examples that I'll show here is, for, is from a study that we recently completed on the wireless emergency alert service. Mm -hmm. And um, that is, uh, WIA, as, as it's called, is a major component of, the, of FEMA's Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or IPAWS. And so the idea here is that um, this is getting emergency alerts on your cell phones. So, it, so um, I'm sure a lot of you have had weather alerts and things like that on, on your phones. And so we did a study to look at some of the risks in this um, WIA service. Um, just to wa walk you through the basic roles, because so some of this will come up in subsequent slides, starts out with an initiator. So if we're thinking about a weather alert, the initiator would be a meteorologist, and say that meteorologist says severe weather is going to come through some geographic area, and like uh, the, the county you're in. Uh, the, that meteorologist will decide, uh, recommend issuing an alert. The alert originator, in this case, the National Weather, Ser Weather Service, would send the alert out, but it doesn't go directly to your phone from the N National Weather Service. It goes to FEMA, who processes and formats it for the commercial mobile service providers. These are the carriers like uh, Verizon, Sprint, and, and, uh, and the other carriers. And then, then they format it and send it to the, to the technology that, that they support, and it gets to your, your cell phones. So that's how the, they call the WIA pipeline works. And we're going to look at the um, CMSP, or Commercial Mobile Service Provider, part of that uh, in this talk. And that's what we focused on in the study. Uh, you'll notice that there's a um, footnote here at, at the bottom of the slide. That's the actual details of the study. I'm just going to be able to skim the service in, in this short presentation. But if you want the details, you can go to that link. Also, on the materials tab, it's not there now, but uh, tonight we'll add the uh, final report to, to the tab so that uh, you can access it uh, from there directly as well. So we have in task one, we'll look at three basic steps. The, uh, determine system of interest, uh, select the uh, workflow or mission thread, and establish the operational views. So what I mean by operational views is what we want to do is we want to model um, what's going on in the operations. Now, if, if you go back to the, what, what Chris was talking about in the previous presentation, how they uh, looked and, and, and gathered information, they were looking at how do things work. And so what we want to do when we're doing the risk analysis is we start by saying, uh, what is the mission thread? Uh, what the system that we're, we're, that we're developing, what's it supporting? What business processes? So would you say the analogy here in, in, in this example, these are, I would say, big objects, you know, the, the mobile carriers and yeah. so on. But they have analogs in the Jeep example in where the systems are the subcomponents right. that Fiat got from various places, whether it was Harman, whether it was Sprint, whether it was the uh, ACUs that are inside there. But again, we have these components, and they're all connected, and together they form some sort of operational. Context. Right, and, and the sense, so the same principles yeah. that I'm talking about apply at at the uh, system level mm -hmm. uh, with the Jeep example, and we're looking at a system of systems level in this example. Uh, but but the same thinking can be applied. Mm -hmm. So um, the other views we look at are things like technology views. Do we um, know about uh, the system diagrams? Uh, can we look at the architecture and network diagrams if, 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 if they apply? Oh, we always like to look at use cases. How do people uh, legitimately use the system? Because that helps us to determine how, how can we abuse the system or misuse the system? What are some of the abuse and misuse cases? We also look at, always look at the data flows, because what we're trying to do is figure out how we can corrupt the data or, or how we can find data that we can view or, or make it uh, unavailable. Um, we may look at physical diagrams, like facility layouts, if we're looking at cyber physical attacks and things of that nature. So we, we want to really understand what would the system look like in its operational context. Again, since we're early in the life cycle, there may be some guesswork involved, but uh, we do know some of this information. 
So uh, I'll, I'll show you kind of the thinking of how some of the modeling, we put the modeling together. Uh, I talked about the five rules of WIA earlier, and this slide kind of shows you, uh, it's a swim lane diagram. Each lane represents one of the roles. And so we start with the uh, swim lane diagram. Then we look at what systems support each of those activities. Uh, so again, as Mark was saying, these are the, the, the at a big level, big systems that support um, a, a fairly uh, a, a workflow that uh, spans multiple organizations. Now, what you'll see in the top left quadrant, now there's a red dash around uh, a box. That's the CMSP box, so the carriers. Uh, and what we do then is we take a look at what's really going inside that box. Let's do a deep dive into that, and we get the detailed workflow. Now, on the same, uh, in the same analogy, we look at the system of interest and the system of systems diagram, and we can explode it and look at the details of the architecture. So we're taking, if you look at the top diagrams, that's kind of the 40,000 foot level. The bottom diagrams are more like the 5,000 foot level, and you can... Uh, Dive down to any uh, level of detail that you need to do, uh, that you need for the analysis that uh, that you're doing. So this slide um, shows the uh, a couple of the key uh, data assets, critical data assets that we identified for this study, and then the confidentiality, integrity, and availability goals that were assigned to those assets. Uh, and so the idea here now is, if you think back to the step two or activity two of the uh, security requirements engineering, now we know what the asset, key assets are and we know what's important about them. And so we can move to the next uh, task, which is identifying or starting to elicit and, and document the risks. So we start with what are the threats, uh, and then based on the threats, we look at the consequences. We then look at what enables each threat to occur and then what, uh, the, what can make the consequences worse, the amplifiers. And then we develop the security risk scenarios. Okay, in this particular example, uh, we looked at four scenarios um, and I'm gonna focus on the top one, ins insider sending false alerts. And the, uh, what we did here is, um, or the basic gist of this risk, is that uh, a disgruntled insider <clears throat> um, uh, uh, decides to uh, plant malicious code into the um, a code base for the, for the CMSP system. And then that will uh, repeatedly send a nonsense message to recipients in a targeted geographic area. So the idea is to annoy people, get them to be angry at the carrier, because the, the, this is one way a disgruntled insider might, uh, who has the technical skills, could, could um, uh, affect, um, uh, get negative attitudes towards uh, uh, the carrier. So, so again, in, in the Jeep example that Chris and I were considering, uh, we have all these suppliers. You could have a disgruntled employee in one of the suppliers to some of the modules that also may want to do a similar kind of um, right. advanced persistent threat or some other kind of uh, malicious activity. Right, and in fact, in this yeah. study, we looked at one of those, and uh, uh, risk three there is mm -hmm. actually looking at malicious code in the supply chain. And, and again, there it was somebody at, because right. an insider in, mm -hmm. the, in the supply chain uh, doing the same type of thing. So exactly, I mean, that, that's an important piece and mm -hmm. um, because um, uh, most of these uh, organizations acquire their um, mm -hmm. systems from, from external groups. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of this. If, if you're interested in the details of any of these slides, um, feel free to, uh, to look at, at the report. Um, this is, what we do here is we, th we break each thread. I kind of gave you the gist of it a, a minute ago. We, we look at the sequence of steps. What does it take to make that happen? Starting with the first step, the, the insider becomes disgruntled. The last step is the uh, malicious code sends nonsense messages repeatedly. And then for each threat step, we look at one or more enablers, and, and we define an enabler as a condition or circumstance uh, that facilitates a threat's occurrence or facilitates that step's occurrence. So in this case, um, when it's sending out messages, you want to know is um, before the messages actually get sent to the, to the recipients, it, are they looking and doing any uh, filtering of the content to see if they can pick up anything that's, that's odd or unusual and stop it before it gets sent so they can do a final check. 
Uh, likewise, then with consequences, we look at the range of consequences. And, and on this slide, you see we look at uh, impacts to the our consequences uh, re with respect to the recipients, uh, the FEMA, the carriers. And so uh, it starts with uh, people becoming annoyed. Uh, they complain to the carrier. Uh, in some cases, they may, uh, if, if, if the situation gets bad enough, they may decide they want to switch to another carrier. Um, and it may actually uh, cause people to lose trust in the WIA service itself. So a lot, of, a lot of various impacts that we look at. And when we look at the impacts, uh, we uh, look at what we call uh, amplifiers. What can make them worse? And then this example here is the geotargeting capability. That says what area should get this, this, this message. Well, if you know how to exploit that, you can actually give it to a broader range of people, and in this case, annoy more people. And so um, we want to look at that because um, uh, when we get to the control section, amplifiers and, and enablers become uh, important as, as helping us determine how to control the risk. Task three, I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with a risk analysis, we use a fairly basic um, risk analysis, qualitative risk analysis process. Um, for each of the um, for each of the scenarios, we look at what we, we subjectively estimate what we think the probability is, what the impact uh, might be, and then uh, look at the risk exposure. And that's done as a really a feed into task four, where I want to spend um, the bulk of the rest of the time. So we use those impact probability and risk exposure um, uh, estimates to uh, rank the scenarios. And we key off of impact because um, what we want to look is we want to make sure as we consider the uh, catastrophic or rare events where you have a, a very very low probability, very high impact. We want to keep those in the in the mix and consider those as part of the uh, mitigation because a lot of the security mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, breaches that that we hear about, uh, you, you look at them over just like what Chris was talking mm -hmm. about in, in the last segment. It, it, you think about boy, that's a lot of work. It's, uh, it's highly unlikely somebody yeah. would, would be able to pull something like that off. Like you were saying, it's so complex and, and, it, and it seems like it's hard to do. But a, a lot of times, the, the big high impact uh, mm -hmm. security uh, attacks that are the ones that are hard to do. Right. And so the, the thought here is it's not really about a technical argument can you do something or can't you do something, or even how hard it is, but what's the risk that you're willing to right. take, and then deciding what's important to focus on versus what might be able to be uh, deferred. Right, right. And so um, we uh, decided that we would mitigate any of the scenarios that we identified that were um, medium or above, and in this case, all of them fell into that category. Um, so we look at control. So for each enabler and amplifier that we've identified, we identify a control, which is a, a, a safeguard or a countermeasure uh, to counteract the uh, enabler or the, uh, the amplifier. In this case, um, the control is doing uh, uh, monitoring of the messages for content, and so that you, can, you might be able to find some unusual um, content that's, that's, that, that's coming through the system. Uh, and so we... we uh, gather those, uh, and in this case, we came up with 35 high-priority security controls in the 15 areas that, that you see on this slide. Uh, we had uh, administrative areas like human resources and training. We had some phys physical security controls that we identified, and also technical security controls in a variety of areas. So um, with this, the, the idea then, uh, in taking this back now into how we feed this back into the security process, not all of these controls are, have design implications. Like, for instance, the human resource processes were operational processes and they had nothing to do with the design of the system. Uh, same thing about the training mm -hmm. uh, aspects as well. But um, these three areas, for, for instance, are examples that, of controls that had re requirements implications. Uh, we found that uh, access control was important, so making sure that people were authorized to only look at the information that they had access that they should have access to based on job responsibility. The system architecture right. are there backup communication channels? So at the, at the main communication channel, so in the in the in the WIA service, you're sending 
uh, messages out to the uh, to the community. If your main communi communication channel mm -hmm. goes down, do you have a backup? And is it uh, a non-redundant backup so mm -hmm. that you, um, uh, if there's a denial of surface attack, you can mitigate that, that attack? And the technical monitoring, we talked about monitoring the messages, monitoring for right. abnormal activity in the system. These all have implications for requirements. And so those are common themes, not just for WEIR or the Jeep, but understanding your, your security needs from an authentication authorization who's allowed to do things. Right. The whole system reliability that is denial of service as opposed to a particular attack, something that needs to be accommodated, and what are the architectures then to support this? It's not just um, figuring out um, some particular kind of uh, security control that goes in there. It's a much larger issue. Right, right. In, in, in most yeah. cases, yes, yes. And, and, and so what you're, you're trying to do is, is, is uh, input these. So now, uh, if, if you're looking at access control, mm -hmm. you should craft a requirement that says that you need to have uh, features in the system that allow uh, for authorization to certain resources in the system, and that not everybody can have, uh, obviously, uh, um, uh, access to everything in the system. So you start partitioning who has um, access to what. And so when you go through the whole list of, of, of con the controls that come out of the risk assessment, you feed them into the requirements, uh, elicitation activity in step four, and now you can start crafting uh, what should be built into the system and then in step five, uh, in doing the, the, the security risk analysis, you've al already identified your um, mitigations or controls to the uh, uh, threats, which links it to the data, and, and uh, it also is uh, then linked to the um, uh, security goals, confidentiality, in uh, integrity, and availability. So you've done a lot of the categorization already. Uh, the risk helps you with the prioritization then, mm -hmm. because as you look at the risks, you say which risks are more most important, and then you can look at what controls are in place, you start to looking at cost-benefit analysis and things of that nature, and then you start to um, decide and make your choices as to, uh, again, it's, there's a trade-off, right? Performance yeah. versus security and cost versus um, uh, security, and so a lot goes into the trade-off space. Right. I assume that in, in these kinds of systems, like and also in cyber-physical systems, this concept of maintenance and authority, the if you like the logical equivalent of the system administrator, uh, plays a big role because we've learned in IT you just shouldn't give the system administrator the ability to do anything anywhere, but we still have a mentality in cyber physical systems that the mechanic, whoever is working on the system, whether it's in, in something like WIA where it might be the, the carrier or the, uh, you know, the employee of the carrier who's doing some kind of work, or in the automotive systems, the physical mechanic or the dealer have unfettered access to everything because they're trustworthy or implied to be trustworthy and that may not in fact match the threat modeling. Right, and in the threat yeah. modeling, what you want to do is you want to start questioning things and right. say, what if they aren't trustworthy? Uh, what happens then? And then you start looking and, and, and creating these scenarios. And so that's where you, you start looking at some of the use cases. Here's mm -hmm. how, um, here's what these people have access to, and, and here's how they use the system. And then you say, well, how can we abuse uh, that trust that we put in people? And that can help you start to think about um, how you want to segment mm -hmm. uh, uh, operational, uh, use, operational use of the system. And I think we have one more polling question. Okay. And Chris's final polling question is going to be posed now is, uh, are your organization's security requirements designed to reduce security risk in deployed software or systems? And while we vote for that one, Chris, do you mind if we get into some questions sure. from the audience? So uh, let's see. Ted here wanted to know, is uh, Sarah integrated with regular requirements development for a system, or is it done separately and then integrated later? Well, it, it's it's integrated with the security requirements pieces uh, pieces of the system, uh, which should be part of your uh, requirements, general requirements activities in in the organization, and so. Um, in general, uh, if you're doing uh, requirement, uh, especially if you're, if you're looking at the security, generating security requirements, you should be doing some form of risk, risk assessment, whether it's zero or some, some other um, uh, version. Uh, there, there are lots of risk assessments out there. But you should be doing some aspect of risk analysis, and it should be integrated into what you're doing. And that should also be integrated into your overall requirements process. Okay. Uh, a couple questions again about if the materials are available to download. If you just go to the download materials tab at the bottom of your screen, you'll find everything. And the event is being archived, so that will be available by tomorrow. Amy wanted to know, how do you evaluate credibility of each threat? Are insiders with security clearances less likely or more likely to become disgruntled? 
Is that a question for Randy Trezak? Uh, yeah, that, that's <laughs> okay. actually a good question for our insider yeah. threat people. Um, I, I think what you what, what you want to do in terms of uh, when you're doing a risk analysis, um, I would look at. Um, uh, you might look at it from two cases. What would a normal, a, a person who has regular access, um, what, 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 what could they do? But what could some of the super users or, or administrator type people do? Because they have, generally have access to more, uh, more, more resources, more information, and they can often do more damage. And so um, I, I kind of, you kind of want, might want to play it a, a few different ways. But um, what I, uh, but what, what I think I w would do um, is um, ultimately is, is defer to what the data from someone like, like our third insider threat team yeah. and what they would say wh wh where the most likely threats are to occur. I don't have a good answer for that right now. Yeah. We'll screen one more from Brandon asking, how do you verify that the risk analysis and probabilities are reflective of reality? Yeah, that, that's a tough one. Right now what we're doing is, is, is using security expertise um, to, uh, to do this and having security experts. And you have multiple experts looking at it from diff different perspectives. And so it's very subjective right now. And so how can you say it, it reflects reality? Well, if, you, if you have multiple experts um, uh, looking at it from different perspectives, that's about as good as we see people doing uh, these days. Um, we don't have a lot of data uh, to, that we can draw on to say that the actual quantitative probability is X or Y. Um, and so that's, that's one of the, the difficulties and one of the areas I think uh, that's ripe for future research in this area is how do we refine that and, and, and improve upon that as, as we move forward. Just to wrap up the polling, polling question, which was, are your organization's security requirements designed to reduce security risk in deployed software or systems? It was 69% yes, 9% no, 22% don't know. Okay. Back to you for your summary. Okay. Okay, a couple key points. Just want to highlight um, that uh, the, the whole focus of what we're, what we're looking at here is software assurance, and, and that has two aspects, predictable execution and trustworthiness. We're focusing here on trustworthiness, and the goal is to have some level of confidence uh, that uh, that you're addressing your risks and uh, that that your uh, uh, that your uh, software is trustworthy. In this case, risk is a good way of doing that because if you're looking at what your highest concerns are, that gives you and you're mitigating them. That gives you some level of conf confidence uh, in in the software that you're producing. Second is uh, with respect to software security requirements. Those are features that uh, preserve the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of system data. And we kind of showed you how in the CIRA method, our first, uh, in our first task, we look at data flows, we look at what's important about the data from a CIA perspective, and then um, that kind of helps you um, uh, get the first step in terms of um, addressing that aspect of, of software security requirements. And then by applying the CIRA method, you look at your risks, you prioritize them, you, you develop controls for the highest priority risks, and then you uh, bring that back into the security requirements engineering process and, and integrate it back together. There's, an, there, there's another element as well, uh, to uh, go back a bit to the one question, the last yep. question that we just got, because mm -hmm. uh, we just didn't have time to really delve sure. deeply into CIRA so that we didn't cover everything. But one of the elements of creating the operational context and the threats is to expand the number of views that are, that are considered, physical views, operational views, data flow views, process views, workflow views. And the point there is that in many circumstances, security is done in a very siloed way. So you ask a system administrator what's important, and they'll say configuring the firewall rules. And if that's not done, they say there's a big risk to the system. Once you get everyone to see all of these viewpoints from who are responsible for the physical security of the system and the maintenance and the development and, and so on, you see all these different views and people get a, everybody gets the same comprehensive view and then the administrator to sort of pull on this thread will say, well, that firewall rule really isn't the most important thing to do because now I understand it's in a locked room and no one can get in anyway and there's no outside connect connectivity, so the firewall is not the real security control that, that's helping make the system secure. And that's a way to avoid groupthink and silo thinking uh, in trying to make sure that you've got the appropriate security you need in order to accomplish what the business mission is. 
Yeah, just to build on that, when, when you look at the views, the, the one thing I wanted to point out, there's a lot of, uh, when you look at the, all the models, it's, it looks like a lot of work, but if you're doing a good job of, of engineering the system, a lot of those will be, should be available anyways. You should have um, what, you, what your uh, workflows are, you should have a general sense of what the use cases are already, so you're not necessarily generating them for this process, but you're leveraging a lot of information that's already been generated. Can we squeeze in two more questions? I know we're up, up against sure. it here, but just, just good questions. One from Andreas asking, this method, like others, appears very similar to failure mode and effects analysis. What are your recommendations to organizations who are familiar with FMEA and want to adopt this method in the security domain? Yeah, w one of the key differences is you're looking at an active threat, so someone's trying to subvert the system, and a lot of times in failure modes, you're looking at, at what, how the failure, failures can occur from a reliability perspective. So you want to make sure that you incorporate um, how um, human actors can uh, might might engage with the, with the system to try to bring it uh, the, to uh, create risk. The short the the sort of soundbite that at least I use is uh, attackers don't obey physics. <laughs> Great. Uh, next one, how often should the risk analysis be repeated over time as the system changes? Yeah, well, and, and so what you want to do is, uh, if you start it in the requirements as we're talking about, um, you want to take another look when you get to the architecture and, and look at what's changed, because when you get to the architecture, you know more. And then as you go through each of the, uh, each of the key activities in, in, in the development uh, process, uh, revisit it at each point, and then, because you're getting, as you move through the, through the life cycle, you're getting more certainty about, about things. Some things that are more speculative up front, you have a better idea as you move through and you can make a, a, a better, better judgments. Okay. I think you just answered this one too, but do the steps to derive security requirements change when following an agile methodology? Um, I don't think so, although I have not um, applied it with an agile meth methodology uh, yet, but I don't think that steps would change. Okay. We actually have done some work in this area as well, and if you like, we can add that to the resource list. Okay, great. Chris, out of time. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Thanks. Mark, thanks okay. for your facilitation. Yeah. We're going to break here uh, till about 2.35 Eastern time, so if you are uh, not going to come back for the, the second part of today's presentation, make sure you go to that survey tab and fill that information there as your feedback is always greatly appreciated. And we'll be back at 2.35 Eastern time with Secure Coding Best Practices by Bob Sheila. See you then.